Varnish and turbo machinery applications has been a problem for almost two decades now. There are numerous reasons for its appearance, including higher operating temperatures, small oil reservoirs, and fluctuating duty cycles. But one reason that seems to cop more attention than most is the move from Group 1 to Group 2 style formulations. If I'm reading the trends correctly, the same factors that have caused varnish to become an issue in turbo machinery are going to start hitting smaller assets like gearboxes, which means that the varnish problem is about to get even bigger. Let's look at why. Here are the API base stock groups. We know them from group one all the way through to group five, and we're going to concentrate just for the moment on the minerals, that is groups one, two, and three. As I've highlighted before, the mineral base oils are made up of three major molecules, the paraffins, the aromatics, as well as the naphthenes. Now their molecular structure gives base oils different properties, and the exercise of refining is kind of from taking group one to group two to group three, and we're effectively making things more paraffinic. In fact, group fours could be said to be almost entirely paraffinic, although that's not strictly speaking true. Now, as I said, these three different types of molecules give us different kinds of properties, and they have both strengths and weaknesses. The paraffins, for example, are very good in terms of viscosity index, but tend to suffer from poor point because paraffins are wax-type molecules. The naphthenes do pretty well across the board, and the aromatics obviously have some strengths and weaknesses too, notably their toxicity. Now, this is an oversimplification. There are actually more families of different kinds of molecules, including the branched paraffins, also known as isoparaffins. We've got multi-ring naphthenes. We also have the alkyl benzene, or single aromatic style rings. And then, for the sake of completeness, let's put a PAO style molecule on as well. Now, there's one thing that I want to highlight in particular, and that's the oxidation stability as well as the solubility. Now, one stark contrast is when we compare aromatics to PAOs. And one thing that you'll notice is that there's a big trade-off between oxidation stability and solubility. So aromatics have fantastic solubility, but not such great oxidation stability. And PAOs are kind of the other way around. Now, where it's more important to highlight is where we go into the naphthenes and alkyl benzenes as well as the paraffins and isoparaffins. Because remember, as we are moving from group one to group two to group three, we are reducing the amount of molecules that are in the blue box, and we are increasing the proportion of molecules that are in the red box. Now, how does that affect our performance? Well, notably, the oxidation stability goes up, but the solubility goes down. And we know that decreasing solubility is something which is going to cause those oxidation products to fall out of solution and cause varnish. Now, the good thing is because we have more oxidation stability, the onset of that is at a much later time. But if we look at, for example, the oxidation behavior of different kinds of base oils, what you'll tend to see is that group one style lubricants follow this kind of curve. So the oxidation increases, it increases at an increasing rate, right? So uh, we know that oxidation is a process that feeds upon itself, but it has this kind of characteristic curve. Group 4 PAOs tend to show a much flatter profile for most of the oil life, and then a sharp inflection point and a sudden increase. So what's actually happening at these inflection points? What is happening there is when the antioxidant pack is completely depleted. Now, it might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but if you test the oxidation stability of a Group 1 versus a Group 4 lubricant, often the Group 1 will come out on top. The reason is that without additives, Group 1s actually have some inherent oxidation stability themselves. The sulfur-containing molecules act as antioxidants themselves. Group 4-style PAOs don't have any inherent antioxidants built into them, and so they tend to oxidize quite rapidly. So what you are seeing in the finished lubricant is improved response to antioxidants. The thing which Group 4s are so good at is responding really well, and the antioxidants are able to seek out free radicals very readily and neutralize them. So we get extremely good oxidation stability out of our finished lubricants. The challenge that we have as we move towards group four, that is a purely paraffinic style base oil, is that the inflection point is much sharper. Now, we're happy for this trade-off, because remember, if we have some kind of oxidation limit, the group four will give us much longer oil life. The thing that we have to be careful of, though, is that when oxidation does start to increase, the onset can be extremely rapid. So monitoring something like ruler, for example, is very much advised. Now, in the turbo machinery world, we've seen the move from group one 
to group two and three style lubricants. And one of the main drivers from this has been the OEMs demanding more oxidation stability. The trade-off that comes with that, of course, is that as you move from group one to group two and three, you are reducing the solubility of your final formulation. So when that sudden onset of oxidation products does happen, they tend to fall out of solution very readily and form varnish and deposits. Now, what is another challenge of formulating with group two style base oils? Well, if you can look at the ExxonMobil slate of EHC products, you'll see that viscosity is pretty limited. It, for, at 40 degrees, we can really only make about an ISO 100, and that's sort of the limit. And when you look at the family of different styles of lubricants that are required, as we move from left to right, we are increasing in viscosity, and you can see that industrial gears are kind of an outlier. And that makes sense, right? In turbines and compressors, an ISO 32 or 46 is pretty typical, but for industrial gears, ISO 220, 320, 460 is very typical, even up to 680, 1000. So how are we formulating mineral industrial gear oils if we don't have those high viscosities available to us? Well, in the past, we have always relied on the group one bright stocks. Group one is actually available in a much wider viscosity range. So if you go back to the ExxonMobil base stock, for example, the base stock slate includes group ones, so the core products, and core 600 and core 2500 have much higher viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius. So you can make an ISO 220, 320, or even 460 style industrial lubricant quite easily from these group one bright stocks. Now, the challenge that we have is that group one bright stocks, for a variety of market reasons, are disappearing from the base stock market. Now, that's a real problem because it leaves a huge gap where we could either use group twos and put a lot of, let's say, polybutenes in to increase the viscosity, but that becomes a quite an expensive exercise, or we're forced into using PAOs, which can, are available in a much wider viscosity range. Now, this is where technology comes to the rescue. There've been some innovations in group twos, which mean that in the next three or four years, there'll be a much higher viscosity range available to us. Going back to the ExxonMobil base stock, for example, that base stock slate is going to include something called EHC 340 Max, which is a very high viscosity group two style base stock. Now, the thing is, we know that this comes with trade-offs. We know that we'll get more oxidation stability but in high temperature gearbox applications, eventually when we reach that oxidation stability limit, we'll produce a lot of oxidation byproducts and the reduced solubility of group two is gonna cause those to fall out of solution and we'll start seeing varnish in applications where we've never seen varnish really before. So that's why I firmly believe that varnish is coming for your gearbox. If you head over to the website lubrication.expert, I'm building a platform to make the job of a lubrication expert that much easier. There's a range of application-based training modules as well as certificate preparation, including ICML's MLA1, MLT1, VIM, and VPR. MLA2 and MLA3 are coming later this year, as well as hopefully CLS. There are tools for lubricant and viscosity selection, and I'm starting to run bi-weekly Zoom meetings where we can all just catch up and share our experiences as lubricant professionals. Best of all, while a range of certification courses are in the order of $1,000 US dollars each, all of this is available for $100 US dollars a month.